So good afternoon. Uh, welcome. My name is Winifred Sullivan. I'm the chair of the IU Department of Religious Studies. I'm delighted to be here in the law school and collaborating <coughs> once more with Dan Conkel and other faculty and students at IU to bring new scholarship to our joint community. This afternoon's lecture and our speaker's visit to IU this week is jointly sponsored by the law school, the Department of Religious Studies, and the Islamic Studies program. So I'm very, very pleased to introduce my friend and colleague, Alessandro Ferrari, professor of law at the University of Insubria in Como, Italy. We have worked together over a number of years on several projects to study the comparative politics of religion and religious freedom. Uh, Professor Ferrari is a specialist in the modern regulation of religion in Italy and in Europe more broadly. He has published extensively in Italian, French, and English on re religion, religious freedom, and now, as you'll hear this afternoon, his new research on the shared legal and religious world of the Mediterranean. I've learned a great deal from Alessandro, and you will too. So I do want to announce that he's also speaking tomorrow afternoon um, in the college uh, on the and the title tomorrow, 5.30, Europe and Islam, the Challenge of Diversity. And that's in the Hoagie Carmichael role. His title today is Religious Freedom on the Two Sides of the Mediterranean. Good morning and uh, thanks to attend this lecture. And uh, first of all, I have prepared uh, a paper for this lecture, but uh, uh, at the hand I changed just between this night and this morning because I'm working on this research about uh, uh, an attempt to compare the constitutional histories of the right to religious freedom in the two Mediterranean shores. And so I most interested very much interest on this stuff now. And so I would like just to propose you this uh, a sort of very, very thin, because you know it's a huge uh, um, topic, but uh, a sort of very short and thin comparison, a possible common history about this right. Okay, to speak of religious freedom in the Muslim majority Middle East and North African countries might seem to be simply a rhetoric exercise. From a Western perspective, the idea that secularism, democracy, religious freedom are an inseparable trio intimately and exclusively linked to the Christian experience is quite widespread. According to this view, not only is Christianity the only religious tradition able to separate God and Caesar, allowing democracy and religious freedom, but history and contemporary survives also allied how the relationships between Islam and these latter Western Christian outcomes still are of inverse proportionality. In a notorious 2003 decision, the European Court of Human Rights declared Sharia, I quote, stable and invariable and incompatible with the fundamental principles of democracy as set forth in the convention. End of the quotation. Ernst Renan's conviction that Islam is the most complete negation of Europe is still an evergreen formula in the European landscape. Nevertheless, these assumptions, which have their perfect counterpart in the Muslim world, are not convincing. So it is for this reason that I would like here to propose the possibility of a common interconnected Mediterranean history of the right to religious freedom. I will emphasize some contemporary consequences on both Mediterranean shores of the passage from an earlier plural and undefined religious freedom to a modern and selective right to religious freedom, defined and controlled by nation states. In fact, only modern states, like Ampti Dumpty in True the Looking Glass, can claim that the right to religious freedom means just what they choose it to mean, neither more nor less. So in Europe, nation state and the right to religious freedom share the same date of birth. In fact, the recognition of the right to religious freedom was the precondition of the primacy of nation state legal systems over their predecessors, the Holy Roman Empire and the Roman Catholic Church. This new right to religious freedom had an amphibious nature, 
being characterized by, by both personal and collective dimensions. With recognition of individual religious freedom, nation states established with their subjects a personal and direct bond of loyalty. At the same time, while they use the protection of personal religious freedom, interpreted as form internum, to make citizens faithfully linked with the state authority, nation states use control over external manifestation of religions, forum external, to shape their collective identities on homogeneous religious boundaries, to ensure social cohesion and public order for the new national apparatus. Therefore, the right to religious freedom was strictly connected with a common national citizenship and perceived as a direct consequence of the political exclusivist link that ties citizens to their nation states. Recognition of religious affiliations was only secondary compared to the bond that connected citizens to the state. Over time, Europe separated civic apostasy, high treason, from religious apostasy, blasphemy, providing citizens a common personal status, imbued with the national religious traditions, but under the exclusive scrutiny of secular state authorities. Without being an explicit constitutional principle and perfectly compatible with formal confessional statements, secularism was the implicit rule of modern nation states, summarizing their separation from civil society and their absolute political primacy in the public and private spheres. From the 19th century on, the absolute individual side of the right to religious freedom provided also a narrative masking a permanent Christian-centered collective side that despite formal separation, Kultur Kampf, and an explicitly anti-clerical secularism, was not perfectly in line with the liberal assumptions of state neutrality. After the Second World War at the, and the Shoah, a new European constitutionalism introduced important changes. First of all, it has softened the primacy of nation states, translating a new universalist discourse about human rights within national frameworks. From national citizenship based on a thick sharing of a specific cultural and religious historical values, this constitutionalism has promoted a citizenship <coughs> based on the sharing of the common principles and rules of a constitutionally democratic political experience life. The national constitutions, the signing of the European Convention for Human Rights and the progressive establishment of the European Union have opened the national state legal systems both to an internal recognition of cultural and religious diversities and to an external cooperation with other national systems. In this framework of weaker nation state sovereignties, pluralism has substituted for social cohesion, public order, security, and nationalism, perceived as authoritarian symbols. Entering the constitutional language and overshadowing separation, pluralism has also become the authentic translation of a secularism recognized for the first time as a fundamental constitutional principle. It was in the 1946 with the constitution of the Fourth Republic that laicite, the secularism, for the first time became a constitutional principle. It was not in the Third Republic. In this way, post-war European constitutionalism managed to fully combine liberal hardwing, a public discourse formally inspired to liberal principle of secularity and rationality, with democratic bargaining, a public discourse also held by religious political forces that doesn't necessarily share these liberal and rational assumptions. Consequently, secularism was transformed from an ideological instrument excluding religion from the public sphere, as it was from the late 19th century, to the constitutional regulator of a plural society. The central role played by democratic bargaining has provided an opportunity for traditional European religions, and in particular for Catholics, to start conciliating with liberal hardware, with self-sufficient secular forms of political power and with human rights. Nevertheless, disproving an overly simplistic idea of ends of history or of an uninterrupted progress, this representation is today seriously questioned. Universality and pluralism in action, in fact, are presenting nation states with the fair complete of their evaporated sovereignty. This situation has not been acknowledged by European nation states. 
is or rather papered over during the Cold War. Yet repression of these deep changes had not been possible in the long period. The end of the Cold War, following 2004, by a big enlargement of the European Union, permanent settlement of a large number of Muslims in the continent, and a deep economic crisis have caught European nation states at a crossroad of this process. The inability and the indecision of Western nation states in addressing the insecurity and the identity anxieties caused by implementing structural universalism and pluralism have polarized societies between a retreat to world war national ties and the gamble of new multicultural policies. Ideology plays a big role in this content, and so does religion. Reference to national religious traditions, both by the contestants and by the partisans of the new globalized order, has become common. Also, nation states have started again using religious narratives for their needs. In fact, not only do religious traditions represent one of their most powerful resources, but the right to religious freedom represents one of the few in relation to which European nation states have kept their autonomy vis-à-vis -vis Bruxelles and the Strasbourg Court. In particular, after September 11 and July 7, 2005, when British Muslims attacked the London underground, Islam started to symbolize the limits of European tolerance, the limit of what multiculturalist policies could accept, the limit of the European boundaries of the negotiated order of the old continent. Pluralism is being challenged by securitarian fears, and the appearance of public order, a concept that had lost its centrality at the height of the post-Second World War constitutionalism. The need to preserve public order and to restore social cohesion reassigns a central political role to the right to religious freedom in the strategy of nation states. If in the 30 years between the 60s and the 80s, the right to religious freedom was mostly interpreted as an individual freedom of choice, from the 19s it has started to be mostly perceived in its cultural and collective dimension. The need to protect social cohesion has served as the rationale for the French and Belgian legal bans of the Bourg. Public order has been the rationale for the ban of the headscarf from French day schools. In both cases, individual autonomy and self-interpretation of personal religious barriers have been subordinated to the authentic political theological interpretation of the European nation state. In both cases, individual religious freedom has been subordinated to the nation state's right to religious freedom. Both, but the disturbing encounter with a now stable Islamic presence not only relativized state neutrality and religious autonomy. Fear of losing their primacy affects European secularism as a whole moving secularism away from constitutional inclusiveness and universalism toward an ideological, modern, Eurocentric narrative. <clears throat> from the embodiment of a pluralistic state, secularism has become an exclusive historically grounded public order, as it was in the 19th century. So in spite of a pretender European superiority, the assertion that pluralism depends on freedom of thought, conscience, and religion sound today in Europe parochial and ambiguous. Due to the pervasive and defensive role of state law, in fact, the relationship between pluralism and the right to religious freedom seems rather of inverse proportionality. The more that pluralism has increased, passing from the law of the book to law in action, the more the right to religious freedom has shown the resistance of the European nation states in really implement the new constitutional boundaries between them and civil society. We might wonder if fear of losing their monopoly leads European nation states to unveil their religious character. European nation states can only recognize a secondary pluralism based on their own theological assumptions. European states have not still renounced and can't to renounce their anti dumping role. Let's see now what is happening in the southern shore of the Mediterranean. With the exception of Morocco, the nation state of the southern Muslim Mediterranean shore correspond to the former lands of the Ottoman Empire. The conquest of Constantinople in 1453 had had, had, had a strong symbolic impact on the Ottoman narrative, and the universality of its power was experienced as absorbing the legacy of the Eastern Roman Empire. 
Thanks to weak political ties with the farthest imperial provinces, which enjoy strong autonomy, the Ottomans didn't face the same nationalist pressures experienced by the Northern Empire. On one side, they could keep the universal aura. On the other, the provinces didn't formally contest the Ottoman unifying role, perceived as a resource against foreign common enemies. The enduring universality of the Ottoman Empire prevented both the development of individual citizenship as a personal bond between local political entities and their subjects, as well as a national state right to religious freedom, charged to found the loyalty of these single subjects to their rulers. In fact, the religious freedom described in the Shariatic corpus and concretely implemented in different local contexts was adequate for the unity of an articulated transnational political community. Consequently, if on the northern shore the nation state right to religious freedom developed an amphibious nature, on the southern shore the Shariatic religious freedom, but not the right of religious freedom, merged ancient Roman and Islamic traditions in a one-dimensional collective freedom centered on an ascribed religious pluralism. If on the northern shore public recognition of the individual form internal was essential for the legitimacy of the nation states, on the southern shore the same form internal kept an exclusive internal moral and transcendent relevance. In fact, the religious choices of individuals were effectively considered free in their internal dimension, and the eschatological salvation of each single faithful depended on their effective sincerity. Nevertheless, these internal individual religious choices couldn't claim any specific protection in the public sphere. On the northern side, development of a nation state citizenship and the formal distinction between forum internum and forum externum in the right to religious freedom legitimized a public dialectic between individual and collective dimensions of religious belongings, and a possible distinction between public and private, but always external spheres, that was managed with much more difficulty <coughs> by the southern version of religious freedom. Sharaitic religious freedom ensured the universality and the unity of the empire, but at the same time, the universality and the unity of the empire strongly influenced the self-comprehending of this freedom. Consequently, religious apostasy remained a civil apostasy, an act that positioned the apostate outside his family and societal ties. Individual religious affiliations remained politically primary without a possible autonomous consistency. The universality of the empire and the primary role of religious ties didn't prevent the development of a secularity not dissimilar than what in the North. A dialectic between religious and political authorities was evident from the very beginning and increased with the time. The ideal Islamic system of differentiation between political and religious authorities based on the Siyaza Sharia soon revealed its bogus character, keeping a mere nominalistic meaning. Following Siyaza Sharia, Religious law, corpus, the Sharia, interpreted following the religious methodology by people specifically training it would have the monopoly of legislation. Political authorities would have not the power to make laws, but only administrative rules which should have to adjust with Sharia. Nevertheless, the Sultan's Kanun didn't follow these strict requirements, and their legislative independent nature became obvious beginning in the 18th century at the time of Tanzimat and the first qualifications. As on the northern shore, where secularity and the confessional character of the nation state coexist, also on the southern shore, the primacy of political rulers over religious scholars didn't need to explicitly discuss the role of Sharia. This would have meant to impair the unity and the universality of the empire. The Sultan could remain caliph, and the ideal Sharia remain an era. This pretense avoided the development of an anti-clerical narrative in Ottoman modernity. With Suleiman I, modernity as a absolute primacy of political authority took the form of a strong Sunni confessionalization of the empire, which was in parallel with the contemporary secular confessionalization of the household empire and at the eastern border with the same process in the Shiite Safavid empire. Three centuries after, at the time of the next stage of Ottoman modernity, 
we don't find the same anti-clerical narrative of the northern shore, but rather an impossible attempt to establish an individual common citizenship without considering the religious rules of the legitimacy of the empire. In fact, the 1876 Ottoman Constitution, while it recognized individual liberty and the equality before the law without prejudice to religion, didn't provide any individual right to religious freedom. The Constitution rather tried to substitute a clear affirmation of the primacy of the state over religions with a reference to an increasingly ambiguous and weak Ottoman identity. The result was that this Constitution spoke about subjects and not yet citizens, and the empire, not yet state. It is worth know how this compromise didn't work, and how the fall of the Ottoman Empire led to establishment of Kemalist Turkey. On the other, it allowed the complete Western European colonization of the southern shore. Both these consequences have had a crucial and persistent effect on the understanding of pluralism within the new political entity. Turkey radicalized the secularism already experienced by the Ottoman Empire, inflating it with a strong ideological narrative able to establish individual links between the new Turkish state and its citizens. The empire became a national state and subjects became citizens. The religious freedom of the Ottoman Empire was transformed into a right to religious freedom, directly linking the individual citizens and the new national state. Religious apostasy ceased to be a civil apostasy and the secondary character of religious affiliations were clearly affirmed. As on the northern side, secularism emphasized the individual dimension of the right to religious freedom as a symbol of its full modernity, <coughs> on one hand, and on the other, it used the collective dimension of this right as an instrument of the national state power. The government strictly connected the religious field, shaping through it a new Turkish social identity. As on the northern side, the rhetoric that surrounded secularism masked the inevitability of its religious and ethically grounded character, and in particular, its Turkish and strictly Islamic flavor. Consequently, internal pluralism was severely compromised by the authoritarian attitude of the new nation state. In the other lands of the defeated empire, Europeans exported only one phase of their secularism. They exported the idea of a centralized national state, but not those of progress, democracy, and political debate. This was because Islam was perceived as a vocal civilization, unable to understand the Western splendors, as well as on the need not to work in colonial country. European colonialism left two crucial legacies to the southern shore. The definitive and explicit overcoming of the Siasa Saria legal system substituting Western-style codes and constitutional texts. <coughs> and as appears especially clear from the 1923 Egyptian constitution, a formal recognition of individual freedoms, even in religious matters, in a non-democratic framework. Differently than in the Turkish experience, the colonized Arab country experienced a silent secularism, which could not openly clarify its relationships with the religious heritage. Despite the declaration of the League of Nations, European states, in fact, not only exploited the tensions connected to the uncertainty of the whole personal religious status system to reproduce the capitulation system, but they also perceived the complex of Ottoman religious heritage both as the symbol of the permanent inferiority of Islam and a conservative force against liberal anti-colonial movements. Consequently, Arab nation states didn't follow the anti-clerical rhetoric of Turkish secularism. Arab state secularism rather produced strong nation states founded on a national and ethnic Arab character, avoiding any discussion of the religious foundation of the state's political power. Theoretically, after 1945, with the birth of new Arab independent nation states, the softer narrative of their secularism could have allowed in these countries a mix of liberal arguing and democratic bargaining similar to what was experienced on the northern shore. Nevertheless, religious political parties were not allowed to participate in political debate, nor Islam did experience the pragmatic challenge of a free public life, and non-Muslims could not really test a democratic constitutional citizenship that was now based on their individual link with this secular nation state. Arab countries, but also Turkey, lost the post-Second World War 
lost the post-Second World North and constitutional momentum. Independence became an occasion to implement a modern model of nation state that European nation states were trying to leave. While northern nation states were opening to an interconnected internal pluralism and external cooperation with the creation of European Union, in the Muslim majoritarian Arab nation states, external cooperation and internal pluralism have followed these things back. The significant participation of Muslim lawyers at the international debate about human rights was not connected with the review of the internal pluralism. This latter was still mainly reduced to the religious denominational pluralism already experienced during the Ottoman Empire. Also, the recognition of individual freedom, including the right to religious freedom, that emerged from some post-independence constitutions, in Egypt, Algeria, and Tunisia, for example, didn't result in a real constitutional supremacy over ordinary laws or an effective democratization of references to public order or morality. The ambiguity of Arab secularism granted to governmental elites, army, socialist and national parties and monarchies, power to maintain a rigid separation between state and civil society and to strictly control the religious field, banning religious political parties and preventing any autonomy to mosques, imams, and religious scholars. The Northern Cold War and the need of Muslim oil legitimized this authoritarian secularism. Individual connections between individuals and nation states were primary not because they were founded on constitutional rights granted from the nation state, but because of a strong nationalism that pretended an absolute and blind loyalty to secular powers. But the constitutional momentum, the passage from modernity to contemporaneity, has also arrived on the southern shore, where a bottom-up pressure invokes a deep political change and more pluralism. The Arab Spring has reopened the question of external cooperation and internal pluralism. On one side, current southern constitutionalism reveals a process of endogenous constitutionalization of international human rights that should not simply be dismissed as a mere assimilation of an order thinking. On the other, the public debate about the religious legitimacy of the state has obliged them, first of all, to take into account the inescapable intra-Muslim diversities, always perceived with a sense of irremediable guilt, the differentiation between political and religious authority, always experienced with embarrassment from the Omayyad time, and the need to overcome personal status in the name of more complex identity and a common national citizenship. Arab Spring, in other words, are trying to answer the question of the legitimacy of majoritarian Muslim nation states and so from the last Ottoman empires. At this regard, the Egyptian and the Tunisian cases are very instructive. Both situations have highlighted the impossibility for constitutional Sharia to keep a unifying role and the pressure towards a more accentuated differentiation between institutional and religious fields. The Egyptian case illustrates both the secular use of Sharia by the state and the failure of the attempt of the Muslim Brotherhood to implement a more confessional interpretation of this reference. Tunisia illustrates the inability of Sharia to unify the political arena and the consequent choice to leave this religious source outside of the institutional field. The failure of the Muslim Brotherhood bargaining has impeded Egypt from solving, through our compromise, the ancient dilemma of the ground of political citizenship, freezing a very tense situation where Sharia and the right to religious freedom remain secular weapons to control the religious field. Tunisia, the birthplace of Arab constitutions, seems on the contrary an example of a compromise between opposite instances. Here, the liberal harboring and the democratic bargaining seem so far to be working. Tunisia illustrates the awareness of a religious Muslim party democratically in power of the inability of Sharia to unify the political arena and the consequent choice to leave this religious reference in a distinct sphere out of the institutional field. <coughs> Consequently, in Tunisia, Sharia has been an explicitly negative aspect of the constitutional compromise, revealing the impossibility of finding a common normative reading of this source and the need to substitute a legalistic form of religious legitimacy with an historical and more inclusive one. But the exclusion of Sharia from constitution also reveals the anachronism in the present Tunisian society, although majoritarian Muslim, of an ethical state 
and the necessity of a real constitutional citizenship founded on the guarantee of fundamental rights by the nation states. At this regard, Article 6 of the Tunisian Constitution introduces two important novelties. For the first time, the explicit recognition not only of the freedom of belief, but also of the freedom of belief and conscience, and second, the recognition of practices without naming limits. In this way, both the public relevance of forum internum to articulate a real pluralism and recognition of a wide forum externum represents novelties not only for the southern side, but also in relation to the common constitutional drafting on the northern side. Moreover, Article 2 of the Tunisian Constitution states that Tunisia is a civil state that is based on citizenship, the will of the people, and the supremacy of law. The reference to the civil state, Daula Madania, has overcome disputes has overcome disputes about the religious or the secular legitimacy of the state. The reference to the civil character strictly anchors state sovereignty to the popular will, like the secularity principle, without impeding the opening of civil society to religion, more clearly <coughs> than the present European interpretation of the secularity <coughs> principle. Some conclusion, I'm finishing. We could ask ourselves if this constitutional momentum has arrived too late for the southern shore. The Arab Spring bottom-up pressure for a real constitutional citizenship occurs when this latter is experiencing serious difficulty in Europe. Moreover, this call for pluralism and for nation states open to political forces representative of civil society coincides with the rising of a trans-Mediterranean Islamic question. For the first time, simultaneously in the north and in the south, Nation states are concentrating their security fears on Islam, adopting similar efforts to organize and control Muslim movement and associations. What this experience of for shores is more widely a trans-Mediterranean constitutional citizenship question, which tests the real capacity of nation states to renegotiate their relationship with civil society, and so to renegotiate the boundaries between institutional, public, and private spaces. On the northern shore, the right to religious freedom paradoxically makes the integration of Muslims in the European political space very difficult. The church character of these rights, in fact, reveals both the role of traditional churches in the European nation states building and the boundaries that separate aliens and foreign citizens from natives. Single Muslims are not admitted to establish individual links with European nation states. Full citizenships of Muslims, in fact, depend on full acceptance of a moderate Islamic church. On the southern shore, where religious references are still explicitly used to found the link between individuals and nation states, the coincidence between right to religious freedom and the citizenship question in its world is even more evident. European campaigns against religious persecution on the Islamic shore ignores the complexity of the issue that involves all citizens of the majoritarian Muslim states regardless of their religious affiliations. This forgetfulness is also the reason why very rarely does this campaign address the question of the European citizenship of European Muslims, rejecting any comparison between the situation of this latter and what of non-Muslims the Southern Shore. Conversely, the same forgetfulness is typical of the campaign of majoritarian Muslim states against European Islamophobia. The trans-Mediterranean simultaneity of the debate, symbolized by the paradigmatic role assumed by the Islamic question in both places, highlights once again the special political nature of the right to religious freedom that still appears in both Mediterranean shores as the essential guardian of the nation state public order. Thank you. I thought it was clear, eh? but there are time for yeah. questions. Yes, this thing is so. Questions? There's a lot of history to come. Could you, could you say a little bit more about the contemporary Egyptian situation and the Muslim Brotherhood? I mean, my own take on it, which is much less nuanced than your historical articulation of, of what happened is that the Muslim Brotherhood won the election, uh, fair and square. Uh, 
Uh, and then ultimately you get authoritarianism taking over at the end of the day. Does that fit into your narrative? Or, or is, is the, I mean, it seems to me that democracy <coughs> proved in, uh, unsuccessful in terms of bringing Islam, or at least uh, a strong version of Islam, into the democratic sphere. Is that consistent with your narrative, or is that something? No, I don't agree, no. Uh, so, uh, Muslim Brothers, uh, you know, I think, the history of Muslim Brothers. What happened, uh, we can just, uh, uh, I will divide the discourse into two parts. What they do with the Constitution, and what was their democratic problem. Uh, Muslim Brothers uh, worked for the new Egyptian Constitution, uh, trying to co make the reference to Sharia that was already present in Egyptian Constitution more confessional. I explain. Sharia entered in uh, Egyptian constitution in 1971 and then uh, was reformed in 1980 by President Sadat. The need to have Sharia in the constitution was a political need. In 1971 was just to uh, stop uh, nationalistic and socialist political party. In 1980, <coughs> the reason to transform Sharia in a source of the legislation, in the source of legislation, was because Sadat was or, or wanted to change Article 77 of the Egyptian Constitution that prevent him to become president for the third time. So in this way, in rendering, render, uh, to change the Sharia and transform it in the source of the Constitution could allow Sadat to have the Muslim Brothers sustained to change Article 77. And from then, Sharia has always been interpreted by constitutional court and the judges of the Supreme Egyptian Court are not at all trained in Islamic sources, and so they have a very secular understanding of Sharia, developing a very interesting uh, uh, interpretation of it, but that has nothing to do, or, or very, that they instrumentalize uh, uh, Islamic uh, methodology for very secular purposes. So when uh, Muslim Brothers wanted to work on the Constitution, they try a sort of compromise. On one side, they accepted that the Sharia was still interpreted by constitutional courts, so they didn't, didn't want to uh, give this role to another religious organization. But they introduced the famous article 219 that uh, tried to oblige the constitutional court to interpret Sharia following the classical Islamic tradition, so the Islamic uh, Mythos of interpretation of Sharia. This was an attempt to constitutionalize <coughs> Sharia. This attempt didn't work because the democratic process, as you told, didn't work for Muslim Brothers. Why that happens? It happens for, I think, two different reasons. On one side, for the incapacity of Muslim Brothers themselves to cope with the democratic system. In the sense that, for example, during the wars of the Constitution, they take uh, very little into account uh, minority sensitivities. And so they try to arrive after years of a strong opposition and avoid the repression to prove that they represent the uh, Islamic people of Egypt. On the other side, it's also honest to say that they face immediately the opposition of the elite of the old regime. On one side, the army, they in the Constitution didn't challenge the role of the army. We have in the Constitution of the Muslim Brothers an article that allows army to trial, so some specific uh, trials when the army was involved, so a sort of uh, extra jurisdiction for the army was kept. On the other side, the judges in Egypt and the Supreme Court too was uh, very against the Muslim Brothers, and so immediately they contested the election of the parliament, and so they decided to declare the illegality of the works of the National Assembly. <coughs> so this was the problem, a very strong institutional conflict between the newcomers and the old elite. On the other, there is another social and political question very important. Muslim Brothers won the election not because they were a, was a Muslim party, but because they were in civil society a very good welfare movement. And so people thought to them as a good people, not corrupted, not connected with the old regime, and that they could help Egyptians to sort out the situation. But the problem that was that from a welfare party, they couldn't be a good political party in managed economic situation. 
But this was in a so short time that any government, I guess, uh, could uh, uh, cope with a so complicated situation. And what we happen now, I think that, uh, you know, the recent uh, measures against the uh, NGO, the recent, we are just coming back to the Mubarak time, or maybe even before Mubarak time. So it's just a blocked situation. Muslim Brothers has lost their opportunity because uh, for this incapacity to cope really with pluralism, but they also encountered a lot of uh, strong reaction. So uh, in Tunisia, for example, the case were very different because Hanada Party, the Islamic Party, has already uh, chosen at the beginning not to present uh, his own candidate for the election to the president of the republic. So Hanada was already much more uh, in uh, you know, Tunisia has also different history, but uh, Hanada, the Islamic party, was already disposed to cope with a sort of political pluralism. So Marzouki was accepted by Muslims as a representative of Tunisia. So they did it, and, but the Muslim brothers was the contrary because they proposed his own candidate. So the bipolar situation, the dialectic, was much stronger in Egypt, for example, than in Tunisia. And in Tunisia, the judges and the, and the elite didn't use with another the same strong reaction because the harm in Tunisia has not the same role that has in Egypt and in Turkey. So if you look at the Egyptian history from the end of the, 20, the, 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 end of the 19th century with the state of Muhammad Ali, that was the first Egyptian state, is always connected with army. It's very close to the Ataturk situation in some way in terms of political forces that lead the Egyptian scenario. Tunisia has a totally different, uh, totally different uh, history, and also this political movement that has recently lost the election, but uh, we are experiencing a sort of uh, uh, democratic, uh, very tense, because uh, the old uh, elite is becoming, uh, coming back also in Tunisia, because uh, the, the, the the, 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 the political party that has won the election in Tunisia is full of people that was, was there at the time of Ben Ali regime. So is always the history is not like uh, a, a speed uh, fast train, you know. But I think that uh, uh, is something that works because of the difference of history of the two countries. Thank you. So uh, this is a terrific talk. I, I was a little surprised, though, by your rather bleak and pessimistic conclusion. Um, because it would, one would think that given the, the history of state building and, 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 and the role of nationalism in, in state building, that it's exactly when there's an enemy, Islamic militancy, in, in, in the example you have, which allows for a coalescing of nation states around these guys. So one could, I, I think, based on the history you've just told us, actually come up with a much more optimistic conclusion, or the possibility of an optimistic conclusion, that, that Islamic militancy might actually lead both European, North Shore, and South Shore to actually think more carefully. Now they have a foil. Islamic militancy becomes a, a useful foil for both sides to kind of coalesce and build the, the kind of secular nation state on the North that you're talking about, and the more nuanced kind of Islamic nation state in the South. So I, I wonder if you couldn't have a more charitable read based on the history you yeah. just told us. Uh, I don't think, I, I'm not so interested to be pessimistic, optimistic, or charitable or not. In the sense that what I try to describe and what is my interest into is to study the idea and the use of the right to religious freedom. So my interest is to see how this right to religious freedom uh, has to be distinguished by religious freedom because the right to religious freedom enter with the nation state. And I'm interested on in see how is a political weapon that's used in different contexts. About pessimism and optimism, I don't know. I'm, uh, I would say if I have to make an evaluation, yes, that in, I think that uh, Islam, uh, Islam, Muslims, I prefer, because Islam, nobody knows what, Muslims, so the, the complex world of Muslims people can perfectly cope with different systems and they can participate. The problem is that uh, maybe that uh, the, the constitutional choice that was made by European nation state in 1945, you know, is something that needs uh, a very strong capacity to cope uh, with uh, 
political representation instruments uh, and uh, because we are we are I'm speaking about nation states in a sort of uh, you know personalistic way as they were person in itself we can use as a lawyer this kind of legal fiction but we have to uh, always to remind uh, that nation states are a complex of what you very well know no but the problem is that now this uh, system of uh, this chain that connected civil society and institution in Europe is very is, is experiencing a very uh, difficult moment because of the crisis of the political parties. So political parties were the idea of uh, the democratic system after the First World War. Now these political parties everywhere uh, couldn't cope with uh, uh, could offer a real representative democracy. We have an European Union which also is a struggle to show itself as a sort of democratic institution. And in all this kind of thinking, national state need to secure their borders. With the, and the, to use public order, some notion that were more classical of the uh, constitutional uh, thinking of the 19th centuries, is the easier way. Is the easier way that can be used directly by the people that is enforcing the peculiar offices. And so Islam is just uh, what make common the two shores because you can see studying the right to religious freedom how nation states in Europe work with foreign states about their Muslim in Europe although Muslim in Europe are European citizens but they decide with Moroccan authority what is the legal status of Muslim Europeans you know Muslims are just people like the other but the problem is just uh, this cultural transformation and this uh, uh, Redefinition of the boundaries of nation states is very delicate. If you see the, to all the questions about the, the Sharia tribunal in Europe, so the Council of Sharia, a matter of family law, what have been the role of the nation state law and the religious laws can be in, in a pluri, in a multicultural society. And you compare the famous speech of Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury in 2008, and the answer three years after of David Cameron about pluralism and multiculturalism, you see really how it's difficult for the state just to, for the European state to act as a guarantor of uh, 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 fundamental rights. I think that national states are very useful. We need uh, to keep this link between individual and the state that can protect you in your personal choices. But the problem is this protection, when it's too much paternalistic uh, in religion and cultural way, can become uh, very, very thick and maybe dangerous. But yeah, uh, I can be also optimistic. But <laughs> Brian. Um, I was, I'm sorry if I, I missed this from your talk. I was wondering if you could characterize the difference between pluralism in Europe and pluralism on the um, in North Africa, the way you talked about it, because it seems that pluralism contrasts with the right to religious freedom, which is individual, whereas pluralism is about society. Um, so how does how does pluralism function different in those two contexts? Oh my goodness. Uh, uh, so no, uh, pluralism in uh, in uh, in Europe has a different history in the sense that it is really connected with the individual link that citizens have with nation states, okay. and this is because. There is also an history, I use the Latin word forum internum. Uh, usually we underestimate the role of the forum internum because we usually uh, use uh, to, to say forum internum is not very important, it's very important the forum externum. In fact, in all uh, uh, European constitutions you see uh, the forum internum absolute and the forum externum very more weak and you say this is an hypocrisy in some way. But the recognition of this forum internum allow people to be recognized as a citizen independently of its own conviction. And this is the basis of the national state. From this basis, you can have an internal pluralism that is individually granted. So the right to religious freedom in Europe is both a right for individual and for associations, but it's primarily an individual right. When you cross the sea, you see that this pluralism is not grounded on an individual narrative is grounded on the idea of the empire, if you use political word of Huma, if you use a religious word. So the pluralism is more connected to the belonging of a subject to a religious group, a denomination, so a specific religious status, or also to a political community. The problem is that uh, 
what role played religious belonging in shaping a political citizenship? In Europe, the problem has been solved, secularizing this religious tie, because the state had the charge to protect your forum internal. In the southern shore, this problem has not been really solved, because we have not nation states. And so the empire just kept this Muslim identity as a cement for the, their own unity. And they didn't know, they didn't have the need to work in a relationship, a direct relationship between individual and the state. The individual was the group already uh, very well packed in the Sharia religious freedom. So the pluralism now that we are experiencing in the recent constitutionalism, uh, Arabic constitutionalism, is much more individualistic. But uh, is not only because of the product of the Western colonization. For example, there are, it's very interesting, the Moroccan case, where the debate about secularism, Ismania, the secularism in Morocco, is just something very autonomous, very used from the past as a totally different way. And it is interesting to, to see how this individualistic framework came also from the religious tradition. And this is interesting because you see the consequences in the Ottoman Empire and the present uh, nation state, Arabian nation state, of this uh, control of the state of the religious field that has imp imp impeded religions to, to use the capacity of their own interpretations. So, you know, but I would say individual and groups, just to make sure. Thank you. So can I ask a question? You make, you know, Alessandro, when you speak, you make this distinction, which I think is less familiar to Americans, between religious freedom and the right to religious freedom. Uh, and, uh, and I wonder if you talk a little bit more about what you mean by religious freedom that exists independently of the nation state. Oh, <laughs> I, I could say very simply, because I, I, I really see you in the sense that for me, you know, it's very difficult to know what religious freedom is. But uh, we know that many people and many actors also in society use the reference of religious freedom. So for me, when I speak about religious freedom, it's the use of this word that is made by non-state actors. So we, we could use not this, the, the word religious freedom, but maybe religious freedoms, in the sense that uh, just to emphasize the plurality and the different meaning of these words. So do you mean in that sense religious coexistence or the coexistence? Ah, no, 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 I, 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 no, 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 I don't want to, to give uh, a substance to this word. I will use as a met as a methodological word. So religious freedom, uh, you know, help me just to say, for example, Sharia speak about religious freedom. There is a religious freedom in Sharia, but it's not a right to religious freedom because right to religious freedom my use is connected to the nation state in the Mediterranean context. So the only, because the right to religious freedom is the only one you can define, because you have anti dumpty that defines the, the right to religious freedom. Religious freedoms is not possible not to define them, apart if you put yourself in a specific uh, position. But from the point of view of the state, is much more clear in some way because the right to religious freedom you have to define in some way. Not to have a, you know, can you have also a cluster, no, the famous Wittgenstein idea, so many definitions, but at some point you have to use a definition in a specific case. So but this is the right to religious freedom. And it's very culturally conditioned, sure, but it's different than the religious freedom used by other political actors. Thank you. Thank you. So any other questions? Yes. Uh, Kevin. Just a, a quick question. When you talk about the Sharia has the category of uh, religious freedom but doesn't give it give you the right of religious freedom, um, I'm not sure what you mean by Sharia here. Are you talking about in terms of classical fiqh? And then who are you talking about? Because it's not one unified corpus, right? Yeah. There's a lot of disagreement about all yes, these, yes, these yes. kinds of things. It, it's not so useful for me to d define more what Sharia is, in the sense that nobody knows what Sharia is. but. I could say Sharia as the corpus of the Islamic uh, thinking, you know, Quran, Sunnah, Ijma, Qiyas, uh, and then the four school, the legal scholar, etc. But what is important for me when I use Sharia 
is to say something that is not connected with a nation state. So religious freedom in the Sharia thinking can be, we can have also in the Sharia thinking many religious freedoms, because Sharia is not interpreted in the same way. And in fact, also in Ottoman Empire, what is was very interesting, the same corpus was experienced in different way, also because Sharia is fundamentally a non-binding law in an external way, because it was more connected with the Qadi uh, powers to Fatawis, to, to, to suggest uh, to some legal advice to single people, it was a, a sort of case law system. And Sharia became more legal in some way from Omar, Omar the strong uh, challenge, the, the, the Omar started to have uh, Qadis very connected to the political power. So it's another question. But when I use Sharia, it's just to say we are not speaking about nation state. This is uh, the border. Yeah. So thank you very much. I think we are, we've run out of time now. So um, thanks for coming. And thank okay. you very much. Alison.